32 teams in 32 days. This is episode number 15, the New England Patriots episode. Let's welcome in Ryan Spagnoli, uh, Patriots SB Nation, Pats Nation podcast. Ryan, what's going on? Not too much. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. No problem. So I guess we have a lot to talk about. I mean, I feel like if I read off all the free agents the Pats signed, we'd be here for hours. They decided to pretty much sign anyone who had a pulse uh, in, over there in uh, mid-March. There were expectations, but it had to be a little a little bit shocking to see them go after all these guys and spend all this money on some unproven players too. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, when you saw the cap space, it's, it's not something that, you know, we weren't used to in the past, right. You had a, you know, Super Bowl caliber roster every year. You had a lot of money tied to the quarterback position as much as, uh, you know, Tom Brady took cap uh, pay cuts and all that. But um, yeah, I mean, going into it, it was just kind of a, you know, which way are they going to go about it? They knew they had some holes they had to cover up from, you know, past drafts just you know some poor roster building in the last few years simply just because they had a really good core there and that core got old and and, you know unfortunately moved on uh but yeah a little shocking uh, but i think when you look at it uh now it was really taking advantage right the cap went down because of covid and and you know a whole lot of things that happened in the past year and the patriots were you know one of the only teams really besides jacksonville and the giants that that had you know premier amount of cap space and had the ability to go out and be aggressive in free agency and really throw money at people on day one, which you saw with, you know, John U. Smith, Matthew Houdon, De- uh, Devin Godshaw. Uh, then they signed obviously Hunter Henry first thing, you know, day two, really that Tuesday when, when legal tampering starts. So yeah, it was, it was a, it was a big, I don't want to say a surprise, but um, I guess a sigh of relief because we knew they'd, they'd be aggressive. There were some reports coming out, but, we'd never seen this before. So which way were they going to go about it? And I think they addressed some major holes at tight end and, and on front seven. Yeah. Let's start with the tight ends. The, the two studs, the two marquee signings, so to speak, Hunter Henry, John New Smith, the Pats haven't gotten production from their, their tight end or tight ends in years. Now they have two great ones, two of the best are around in the league. What is this going to do for, for this offense? Yeah. I mean, when you look at this, the amount of success that they've had, um, you know, obviously you look back to Aaron Hernandez and Rob Gronkowski, what they were able to accomplish kind of, you know, change the game in a sense. Uh, but even in past years, right. I mean, Dwayne Allen with Rob Gronkowski was a really good piece, you know, really chipped in in the run game. Um, Martellus Bennett uh, for a few Super Bowl runs there. Um, so they, they, that's just the, the, the prototypical Patriot way. They love to dominate the middle of the field, uh, run that 12 personnel, you know, heavy mix of, of running the ball and, and quick and um, efficient passes. Um, so I think it makes Cam Newton or whoever, Jared Stidham, whoever's playing quarterback for them next year, made their job a whole lot of uh, easier. They'll be able to kind of dominate the middle of the field, dominate in the trenches with that very strong offensive line, as well as, um, you know, add a key piece on the outside, like Nelson Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne to help them, uh, you know, kind of underneath. Do you think, so obviously Johnny was the first big signing on Monday afternoon, technically, well, yeah, m- Monday afternoon during the first day. Then, then they're sitting here on Tuesday. They signed some, some more players Monday afternoon, Monday night. And then they're, they're sitting here Tuesday saying, okay, Hunter Henry is still here. Obviously, you know, not getting the offers that he wanted. They swoop in late Tuesday morning, sign him. Did you think this was their plan all along to get two star tight ends, the two best tight ends on the market? Or is this kind of like, okay, we got our number one guy and then Hunter Henry's still there. Why not? We have the money to do it. I think looking back, it was a big plan um, simply because, you know, like I said, they had a ton of success with that two tight end set. They've got virtually nothing from that position really since Rob Gronkowski retired and then obviously moved on to Tampa. Uh, but we were, it was funny because, you know, that night we did a free agency recap show. We talked about John Smith and his contract talking, you know, well, I wonder where Hunter's going to go. I wonder what he's going to get because, you know, it was kind of those two dueling out, but you figured that Hunter Henry would kind of be that first domino to fall. He'd demand the market. Right. Um, and then when they got two of them, you know, I mean, simply it, it had to be a plan, right? I mean, like I said, they took advantage of, of teams not being able to really spend much. A lot of teams being up against the cap because of the, you know, the circumstances of the past year. Uh, and they took advantage of that. So, yeah, I think that was a big plan. I think they looked at their team the last few years and noticed that, you know, we've got nothing from this position and it's such a big way of how we run our offense. we got to upgrade and we got to upgrade quick. So the receivers, obviously, Nikhil Harrigan gets joked about a lot, but there weren't many passing touchdowns for the Patriots last year. I believe they were towards the bottom of the league in that. Part of that in due to Cam, part of that due to the lack of speed and talent on the outside. Bringing in Nelson Aguilar, who had a very underrated season with Vegas, and Kendrick Bourne, an underrated speedster from San Francisco. What do they bring, and do you think New England is done with the receiver position this offseason? 
I think in terms of signings, they're, they're done. Uh, obviously, there's a little bit of a red flag with, with Edelman. There's a report coming out that he may not be able to play this year. Um, so it's kind of filling that role. I think you have Jacoby Myers, maybe a little bit of Kendrick Bourne to be able to do that. Um, I do think they'll look to get some help through the draft um, just to get a little bit younger, add some more depth there that they had the worst, um, you know, wide receiver group in the, in the league last year, got, you know, a lot better with those two signings, but I still think there's some pieces to fall. But as for Aguilar, it's a, a you know, an X receiver that can play the outside stretch the field, somebody that they really haven't had since Brandon cooks uh, and, and Kendrick Bourne brings you versatility, you know, on the outside inside a uh, guy who's going to dominate in the, in the intermediate game and a pretty good yak receiver too. So, so, so we'll talk about the draft in a second. So you think that they're done signing guys. I would probably agree. There's not, there's nothing really top heavy there anymore. It, it just, you know, a lot of depth. Um, but you think that that's a position that, that they might look at maybe fit, maybe 15, maybe with some of those comp picks that the, that the Patriots always have. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's, you know, they have a little over 12 million in cap space. Obviously there's some, uh, uncertainty with Edelman and then uh, so you, you might be able to free up some space there or, you know extend a Gilmore to create some but I think with it being three weeks in the draft that that's their heavy focus now um, and yeah I do think you know may, maybe not so much round one uh, I think they've had a, a tough time kind of identifying receivers and being able to develop them you know i.e. Nikhil Harry I don't think he was put in a great situation um, as much as the pressure he had of becoming a first round pick but yeah I would expect you know day two day three to at least take one, take a, you know, a viable, reliable type wide receiver that can develop into something, not necessarily a true number one. Uh, although, you know, a Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith, someone like that, Rashad Bateman would be nice. Um, right. I think they, they may look to move out, move back, gain some capital on day two and three and, and ultimately select one of them. So bringing in Matt Judon, bringing back Kyle Van Noy, I think everyone saw the latter coming. Uh, the Pats didn't have much pass rush last year. They were toward the bottom of the league, ton of injuries, ton of opt outs. So bringing in these two guys going to immediately make the pass rush better. What were your thoughts on uh, those two acquisitions? Yeah, I love the, the Udon signing. Um, I think that's somebody that can set the edge a little bit. Vers- they bring a lot of versatility, really good against the run. Um, I, I believe, you know, 37 and a half sacks, something like that over the last five years. He was a franchise tag player last year. So that's how much he meant to the Ravens. Um, that's a guy who really fits their scheme. And as for Van Noy, uh, he's a guy that, you know, an off-ball guy can cover sideline to sideline, chip in a little bit in special teams, a leader of that defense. I think they missed a Kyle Van Noy last year. When, when he's on the field, everybody's kind of in their slots. Uh, when they didn't have him last year, you know, he had some holes. Uh, then obviously you have Josh Uche coming back, who uh, is a little bit of a tweener between an off-ball guy and edge guy. Uh, but they have some guys that can set the edge between Hudon, Uche, uh, Kyle Van Noy and Chase Winovich, it's just going to be rotating in and out. They'll be able to get to the pasture uh, a lot easier than they were last year. Yeah, so it's it's interesting because the Pats feel like they always have guys. And over the last couple of years, they always have. They People say they, they draft bad, but towards those later rounds, they, they always find players a la Kyle Duggar uh, in the second round last year. But for the – the pass rush specifically, it, it's always felt like they, they've always had so many of these guys like rotationally. Now, last year, it didn't seem that way. So getting getting these two guys, obviously bringing back Calvin, who was, who was a huge part in a couple of those Super Bowl runs, and Matt Judon, who was arguably the best pass rusher on a very, very good Ravens front seven. Yeah, for sure. Like I said, I, you know, they, their defense got so much better in, in like a 24 to 48 hour period, really that week. Um, and I think that, you know, moving on to the draft, um, with as many guys as they signed and locked up, you know, long-term and kind of identified who their core of that team is, it makes sense to be able to move up, maybe get a quarterback, get your franchise guy, uh, because you can afford to mortgage some of those picks now where you, you fill a lot of your holes through free agency. So Cam Newton, when I say those two words, when you hear those two words, what do you feel and what do you think? I mean, it's, I say it all the time. I'm not the biggest camp supporter on the field. Um, You know, it's kind of divided over here at Pats Nation. Some feel he can play. Some feel, you know, somewhere in the middle of that. Some feel that, you know, he doesn't have it anymore. I'm probably somewhere in the middle. I think his struggles last year, um, you know, I think it was coming in late in a weird year. uh, Really hadn't played much in a year. It's a very complex playbook to learn. We all know that. Uh, Didn't really get an offseason. And the lack of talent around him really hurt him. 
but you do see some signs of him not being able to throw the football accurately down the field, timing throws, something that they like. So, um, you know, I, the one thing I will say is a pref- professional, somebody that you can look to as a leader and somebody who a young kid can look, okay, that's how you be a pro and be a really good mentor, whether that's to Stidham as the next guy or, or a guy that they draft, whether it's the first round or fourth round. Um, so I do think the Cam Newton signing made sense at a, at an, at an, at to a point at the time, uh, just to kind of attract those guys and say, okay, we have a plan B here. This is a guy who has a lot of cloud around the league, guys like guys can, you know, go to and, and use as a, as a mentor type. Uh, but I also do think that there might be something else up there to see here uh, coming in the next few weeks. Right. It's, it's been talked a lot about on this podcast with a, a couple other guests I've had the quarterback succession plan. And as of now, that might change. This might change in the next 17 days by the time this podcast release, but the Patriots don't have one. How do you see, or how do you think that might change in the, in the next year or so, or even in the next 20 days? Yeah, I, I it's it's hard I mean uh, I think it's gonna have to be how they shake out um you know I, I I'm big on Justin Fields I, I would love a guy like that in here especially with Cam Newton um you know I think they have a relationship from the past I, I think that'd be a really good, good situation for him to come and sit behind uh but also you know I wouldn't be surprised if they don't address it at all I mean, people forget uh last year they were all in on Jared Sidham uh, up until July they didn't draft a quarterback he was their guy until you know Cam came came along so um is it more of a competition this year? Do they kind of push that, you know, quarterback position out another year and maybe go year to year with Cam like they wanted with Tom? Um, I don't know. I, that, that's the biggest question mark it has been for the last year and a half now. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get some more clarity on it within the next few weeks. So pick 15, do you see them actually picking there? Because back in January, there's a lot of Kyle Pitts, Mac Jones talk. Those ships have probably sailed at pick 15. Do you think they're, they're thinking about trading up, trading down? What, like, where do you think they're leaning if if they do stay at, at pick 15? Yeah, I mean, I would like to see them move up. Uh, it's very unconditional, uh, uh, uncharacteristic of them. Um, you know, they're typically moving back and gaining capital, right? But I think if they have a guy pinned on their board uh, that they like and they feel is a top five talent and they can go up and get and feel the price is right, I think they do it. But I don't think ultimately they pick at 15. If those top quarterbacks are off the board, you know, one doesn't necessarily fall in their lap or the price is too high to move out. Um, I think they move out because there's a gap between uh, 46 and 96. They lost their own third rounder for that, um, you know, whole debacle that went on in Cincinnati back in 2019. So trading 15, maybe picking up a late one, early two, as well as another third to kind of fill that gap and really have a cream of the crop picks between, you know, say late, early, uh, early 30s to 90, have four to five picks in there. That's typically how they like their board to work. Um, the only bad thing is you, you miss out on the top quarterback, right? But how do they feel about a Kel- Kellen Mond, Davis Mills, Jamie Newman, or those guys that they have higher on their board that they feel they can get a developmental guy in here, similar to what they did with, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo, Jacoby Brissett, and, and even Jared Stenham to an extent. Yeah, so they have 15, 46, and it wouldn't be a Patriots draft without the comp picks, 96, 120, and 122, and also 139. What other positions do you see them attacking? Yeah, I mean, before the draft, you know, you had, you had expected, really, you wouldn't know where to go. I mean, before the before free agency. Now I think it's, um, you know, if they were to stay at 15 or even pick up, pick later in the first or early day two, I, I think it's corner and offensive tackle. And the reason I say that is you have J.C. Jackson, who's a restricted free agent with a second round tender on him. Stephon Gilmore is as on one more year of his deal, making about seven million. They pushed money from this year or, or last year from future years back to, to kind of pay him a little bit more after his defensive player of the year, uh, and then tackle. Right, you have Trent Brown who came back. He's on a one year deal. Isaiah Wynn, he's on a one year deal. Do they pick up his option next year? He's had a tough time feeling staying on the field. So, getting maybe a true number one, a guy like Gregory Newsom. Um, you know, Eric Stokes out of Georgia, some of those guys that can be there in the back half of the first round, if that's the route they go, or one of those top tackles. They worked out Christian Derrissaw or Sean Slater. Obviously, I think Sue will be gone, but, you know, Elijah Vera Tucker brings that versatility. I think those are two key spots. And then after that, it's kind of filling in, you know, depth and, and some role players that receiver edge, uh, even linebacker. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting because when I'm talking to our Vikings guy and then chargers, they're like, yes, Elijah Vera Tucker's our guy. We're going to get him 13, 14 passes in your 15. 
might he might not be there. He's obviously a very hot commodity because of the versatility. He was the highest graded uh, guard in the Pac-12 last year and then the highest graded tackle uh, in 2020 in the Pac-12 after he pretty much replaced Austin Jackson over there at, at left tackle for USC. So he's, I mean, I, I have him as a top 20 player, great talent. And Derrissaw as well also could be there. If they were sitting there at 15, both of them available, who do you lean? I think Derrissaw. I, I personally think he's the second tackle in the class. That's where I have him rated. Uh, I think he fits what they do. Uh, very smart kid. Bring some versatility. I think that's a guy who you can start at right tackle, maybe move him over left as his career goes on. Uh, and I think you're getting, like you said, a top 15 talent. And it'd be the most, you know, Patriots thing ever. Select the tackle at 15, right? Not the sexiest pick, but it, it's going to help protect your quarterback and make you a really good football team for, for the future. Yeah, so real quick, before I let you go, I always do this with our guests. I'll give you a few players who might be there at 15 and – you're the GM, you're Belichick, you're Kraft, and you're going to make the pick. So let's think. So Waddle's there, Derrissaw's there, J.C. Horn is there, and uh, Elijah Vera Tucker is there. And, and Mike, That's really tough. Micah Parsons is there. Micah. I don't yeah, know that's a tough one. I, I had said, um, I had released a tweet. I, I watched that Kyle Pitts versus J.C. Horn this past year, and it was, it was you know, elite football, right? They're just going at it, jawing at each other, just, you know, really good. Um, and I'd said if, if they stick at 15, J.C. Horn's my guy. Uh, South Carolina guy, I think he has the, the length and, the, and that kind of that dog mentality to play outside corner and, and develop into a future one. But it's hard to pass up on Jalen Waddle. I, I know everybody gets compared to him, but I think that's the closest thing we've seen to Tyreek Hill um, to come into the league. A guy that can beat you at all three levels of the field. He can beat you vertically in the intermediate game, behind the line of scrimmage with bubble screens. Um, so J.C. Horn is my guy, but since you threw Waddle in there, I got to go Jalen Waddle. Yep, there you go. I mean, I I would agree whether they're at 12, 13. If he falls all the way to 15, he'll probably be the best player available consensusly. Maybe Darius has a chance. Um, obviously, Kyle Pitts probably not going to fall but or anymore. But, um, yeah, if, if Waddle's there with the needed receiver – they have depth guys, but they don't have a, a number one. Nelson Aguilar is not, not a number one. Kendrick Bourne is not a number one. Myers is not a number one. Obviously losing Bird too. Um, so yeah, that that would seem as if like, yeah, he's the number one guy. That's who they should take. Derisaw could be a potential all pro. Same with Tucker. But like you said, I agree. Waddle is probably the, the best player available. If, if Micah Parsons is there, let's just say this. Because there's the off the field stuff, but... If he's there, he's the best player on the board. He's arguably a top five talent in the draft. How how much of a turnoff is the off the field stuff allegations right now for you? Yeah, I mean, you've seen this in the past with Belichick, right? They'll be able to take a guy in if they feel that they can, you know, get him to adapt and, and you know, uh, get him in the building and really, you know, get a, get a good look at him, get him into their system and, and really help him with, you know, obviously with what happened was, was terrible, but if they feel he's matured and they can, um, you know, the Patriot way can sort of change him and, and change his ways, they, they'll, they'll draft him. You know, you've seen Antonio Brown come here and certainly guys with histories before Randy Moss, not, not necessarily as bad, but, you know, kind of bad reps around the league come here and really blossom. So they feel they can fix him and really get him into a good spot to really develop him into a, you know, a good person and a good player. They'll take him. Yeah. Because, you know, if obviously all these, allegations are true about the hazing at Penn State that's obviously terrible for everyone involved but it's weird because it hasn't affected the other Penn State players who were also involved in allegations like Gross Matos who was there who got drafted by Carolina in the second round last year it hasn't really affected him yet so 17-ish days before the draft hasn't really affected anybody so we'll see how that plays out he's a top five talent one of the best players in the draft so we'll see where, where he ends up falling could be to 15 if you know some teams don't want to deal with it. New England, like you said, sure, possibly might want to. But uh, obviously, great stuff from Ryan. Ryan, thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. Make sure to follow Ryan on Twitter at Ryan underscore Spags. Um, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching this episode of 32 Teams in 32 Days. I'll catch you in the next one.